I'm so thrilled today to be um, introducing Edie Ray and Libby Buck, who will be speaking as well as myself. My name is Yvonne Dallincourt. I'm the director of the Nantucket Field Station. We are an entity of UMass Boston. We're managed by the School for the Environment and we sit on over 100 acres owned by the Nantucket Conservation Foundation. We run classes and we support researchers from a wide range of institutions, agencies, and other universities. You don't have to be from UMass to use the field station. We are, however, in remote uh, operations at the moment and um, yet we are very happy to be providing these seminars. Um, so for those of you watching on YouTube, um, please uh, note that you can use the top chat or you can write comments um, and ask us questions or make comments. And um, I'm going to give an overview of the um, Christmas bird count in a very general sense. For those of you that are not on Nantucket, um, you can follow along and then we'll launch into really looking at it through the lens of our local island and what we're doing here. And so for people tuning in to find out a little more detail about how you can get involved, it won't matter whether you're on Nantucket or off of Nantucket, we're going to help you to determine what you can do. And if you're on Nantucket, we're definitely going to tell you um, how to get involved if you're not already. And if you are already, um, still feel free to send us questions and pipe in. Um, so once again, um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Libby Buck and Edie Ray. Libby works for the Nantucket Conservation Foundation and um, is an ecologist and has a job many people would love. She's outside a lot. Edie is a local bird expert and a co-compiler um, and I am just thrilled that they've agreed to join me this evening and we're very happy to be uh, making this information available to everyone. In addition, a lot of people on the island um, that work for the Nantucket Conservation Foundation, for Mass Audubon, um, for Mariah Mitchell, Linda Loring, uh, among other people, the trustees of reservations. There's a lot of groups that will be participating as well as a lot of individuals on our island. And Nantucket is a great place to bird. We have a lot of conservation space and open space, um, but we also have a lot of feeders and we'll get to um, how you can be involved whether you're out in the open space or whether you're watching in your backyard. And I am, um, should be seeing my slides go forward and I apologize for this um, minor delay in that. Okay, we're back on track. So what is the Christmas bird count? Um, and I would like to tell you a little bit about the history of it. So the Christmas bird count has been around for um, quite a while since its 121st year. Uh, it is a bird census basically, and it happens to be the longest wildlife census or one of a few very long wildlife censuses. Um, and it's organized by the National Audubon Society. It runs every year in the winter time and it's called the Christmas bird count uh, because it is in the winter and it happens in between December 14th and January 5th, but not the entire time. It happens on one day um, in, it happens on just one day in, during that period. Um, and that day is of choice um, by the people compiling in that local region. Um, volunteers uh, spend the 24 hour period or some portion of it either watching their feeder or um, their backyard or being part of a group that's out in the field. The thing is uh, the data is compiled in a way that hasn't changed since 1900 when this um, first started and Basically, uh, it's broken down into circles that are 15 miles in diameter. And um, 
the volunteers count within a count area that is that circle. And so how did this um, first start? Uh, Frank Chapman, um, who was an ornithologist and a curator and a researcher at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, um, was also an editor and an author and wrote for the Auk and the bird lore, which had started right around this, the same time that um, he really proposed a Christmas bird count. And the reason he did this, when you look back and think he, he was a man who lived towards the latter half of the 1800s, the Victorian era. And um, the Victorian era was full of people who were just enthralled with um, our natural environment. If you look in the um, artwork and in artifacts that um, were created um, from things that people took from nature, people really uh, wanted to be part of nature, but at the same time, they um, tended to take excessively and created problems. And some of the traditional activities like hunting were thought to be um, competitively sporty, uh, actually ended up becoming just these giant um, kill zones of, of birds and other things. And so he, in his writings and his logs of this um, type of activity, would record the total number of birds that were both seen and also killed during some of these hunts. And through his study, he could see that those numbers that were seen were declining through time. And so he was in a very good position to actually say, this is a bad thing. And we need to look at what we're doing to the things that we really enjoy being part of and having. Um, we're actually killing them off. And now we look back um, and we can see that really easily they were just killing everything off. Um, but at the time, the things like the Christmas side hunt um, were social, you know, activities that people uh, didn't really think so badly about. They, they became, however, very excessive. The Christmas side hunt was a sporting um, tradition that happened on Christmas where people would go out and they would just kill things. And it no longer was about killing for food. Um, they may have used the feathers in fashion, but that certainly didn't warrant the excessive killing that began to um, really take place. And it took out a lot of species of birds as, as well as other things. So Frank Chapman is credited with being able to um, change that uh, mindset and to shift the, the paradigm and to get people to get rid of their guns and start using their binoculars and actually counting. And this idea of a count is, um, is exceptional because it, it does um, still provide something fun to do. So, you know, why have a Christmas bird count? Uh, for the volunteers, it's a way to make a contribution to get outside and enjoy the environment, to enjoy birds. It's also a fun thing and a sociable thing, and it can be competitive. Um, and in that way, it kind of replaced some of the um, things that were going on, uh, you know, over 120 years ago, but scientifically and of value to us in terms of uh, managing and caring for our natural resources, it's very valuable to have these long data sets. Um, so it, there's a, a great reason to have a Christmas bird count and we can thank uh, Frank Chapman who um, has also left us some fabulous books. Um, he was a real author and educator um, in many ways. And um, so it's not a quick thing though to change how people behave and think. Um, this type of data set is very different from some of the other platforms we use. So things like eBird are fantastic iNaturalist is a, a great way to share data if you're 
watching, if you're birding and you're uploading things you observe. But this is different. This is a very long data set and um, it has gone on for 12 decades. And it's a snapshot in time of our bird populations. It's really um, over the Western hemisphere. Uh, but it's one of the longest running wildlife censuses. And that's um, very useful. And you can um, see it in over 300 publications, science publications that have used the Audubon data set. So in addition to being, um, to existing, it's also something that's shared. And that's a very valuable thing for all of us. Um, you can uh, see declining populations, but you can also see rebounding populations. And you can, see them across all of the geography where they're noted. So it's a very useful um, data set. And how does it work? How do we actually do this? So it hasn't changed since its inception uh, very much. And you have essentially a circle that's a count area and it's 15 miles um, in diameter. And so our little island here of Nantucket fits nicely in one of those circles. And uh, you have a, an organizer and the compiler um, works with that person and the compiler takes, or you could have multiple compilers like we do here on Nantucket. And we'll hear from Edie Ray, who is one of them. Um, feeder watchers and field watchers are the people that are out there um, the volunteers reporting what they're seeing and where they're seeing it and how many um, they see. And they do this in one day, in a 24 hour period. You can spend as much of that time watching and recording, um, but that is the day that you count. And that day is decided by the people that are in charge of your circle, your count zone. Um, there's also a three day period before and after that day where you can log presence and absence um, of species, but you're not counting on those days. Um, and then the data gets checked and sent eventually to the National Audubon Society and they compile it and they share it with the public. Um, so how do you get involved? Well, if you're on Nantucket, you call or you email Edie Ray um, and we'll give you that information. If you're not on Nantucket and you wanna be involved, you can find out by going to the Audubon website. And on their website, they have a uh, map area where you can look at this map of um, the world and, um, or yeah, it's a map of the world, but it shows you these uh, particular um, circles that are either red or yellow or green and the red ones are if you look at the the legend are close to people participating uh, more and the yellow ones will um, take participants or at least tell you what's going on as well as the green but you can click on any of them and if you zoom in on that map and this lower right hand corner of our slide shows you what happens if you zoom in. Um, I'm looking at uh, our island down here in a circle and if I wanted to know more information I would click on the center of that circle and it would open a box that tells me who the compiler um, I can contact is. There are other comments which you should read because there might be more than one compiler. Um, it will tell you the date. So again if you look back at um, the fact that the Christmas bird count could take place between the middle of December through the middle of January. How do you know when it's going to be for your area? Will you find that in one of these circles? So if, if you want to be involved over here or up in Boston or down on Long Island, you can click in that circle and it will tell you when the date is or was, because it may have happened already, um, and who to contact about that. This year is an anomaly because of COVID, like everything else. Um, some of these might not be taking place. Some of them may change their date or how they compile, but we do have to stick to the guidelines of how we generate the data so it gets done in this 24 hour period. Um, and also, we have to ab abide by Audubon's um, COVID safety plan, as well as our own local and state public health plans. Um, so safety first, don't uh, go out with people that are not in your household. 
and um, don't involve yourself if you don't want to because of COVID. Anyway, um, so you're more than able to be involved from your home looking at your feeder, which is a great um, contribution that you can make. Uh, so these are a, a lot of text and um, you'll notice that all of these links uh, have Autobahn at the, the beginning of them. And my point is, if you have questions, you wanna learn more about this, you can go to the Autobahn website. And uh, the very first one that's listed, this really lengthy one, is the site of maps. Um, and that's something that you can zoom in or out of, and you can get a lot of information about your local area or a nearby area. What's great about the fact that we don't all do this on the same day is that you can be involved in multiple um, counts if you wanna contribute because they are on different days. And with that, um, I am handing things over to Libby Buck. Thank you, Yvonne. Okay, so I wanted to jump into the brief history of Nantucket and why Nantucket is so unique for the Christmas bird count. So the Nantucket Christmas bird count started in 1954 with only three people um, covering the whole island. And the driving force was the famous ornithologist Edith Andrews from the Mariah Mitchell Association. She kept it going for many years and it keeps on going and it keeps attracting more birders to flock to the island to help participate. Um, Nantucket, as we know, it is a very unique place. So it has many different habitats and most of the island is protected conservation land. So like my organization, Nantucket Conservation Foundation helps to protect over 9,000 acres of the island, which includes like crucial habitats for birds, such as the sand plain grasslands, forests, shorelines, salt marsh. And without that, we wouldn't have such a high variety of birds, which Edie will get into that later when we get into more of the details of numbers and everything. Um, Nantucket's placement uh, along the Atlantic coast is also really cool. Um, it helps to increase the chances of rare birds to show up for a Christmas bird count. So when it comes to migration, Nantucket is either the southernmost limit for some species or the northernmost limit for others, especially when it comes to sea ducks. So some birds find it, um, Nantucket's climate safe enough to overwinter for survival. And so that's why we get a lot of strange and rare birds that will show up. Um, so with this chart that I made, um, the National Audubon Society recently created a list of the all-time highest counts for individual species in the United States. Nantucket made the list of quite a few times. So we have the white-winged scoter, which we had over 41,000 um, in 2012, and then the long-tailed duck, which I'll get to that too, but we had over 525,000. Um, and then I know Edie has a really funny story about the Northern Lapwing and how we have two. We have the record of two here. Um, and then the yellow-legged gull, we have one, and then the Eurasian jackdaw, which was two in 1984. Um, so with the long-tailed ducks, the long-tailed ducks do this roost flight, and it's one of my favorite events that happens during the Christmas bird count. Um, for years out in Madiket, hundreds of these long-tailed ducks will feed on the Nantucket Shoals and then they roost for the night in the Nantucket Harbor. And they will cover the sky in one big, plow, one big cloud and it only really happens during the winter on Nantucket. Um, unfortunately, the recent bird counts, the numbers haven't been as high as usual, but again, we wouldn't really know that information if it wasn't for these annual Christmas bird counts. So you can see why this long-term data set is really important. Um, so I'm sure you're thinking like, how does one count all these birds at once? Um, and how do you get involved and everything like that? So I'm gonna turn it over to Edie for some more guidance on how we conduct the Christmas bird count on the island. Thank you, Libby. Mm -hmm. Are you there? <laughs> or I'm gonna talk and I'm gonna hope that you guys can hear me. Um, so, um, how do you count over 500,000 birds, Libby? You asked me before and I told you, one at a time. One, two, three, but really, not really. But we'll talk about that. So let me tell you a little bit more about the sort of how it's organized here on Nantucket. 
Um, as um, Yvonne said, the island fits nicely into the count circle, but then we divide the island up into eight different sections. And we've had people coming here from off island to help us do these counts for literally decades. And they'll count in the same area of the island every single year. And it's really cool because they then have a, a very good perspective of where to look for things, what to expect. And there's sort of a little bit of a, let us say, a competition amongst some of the birders to try to find the most of something or the most unusual of something. So it's a really great event to get out and have a real camaraderie. Um, as well as a little bit of competition. Um, on, as um, Yvonne said, the count day is uh, a 24 hour period. Some of us are out for almost all of the 24 hours because of course you can go look for owls at night um, and whatnot. Um, others are a little more sane and stick to daytime birding. So if you decide to come and help, the choice can be yours. We don't make you stay out for 24 hours total. Um, and also, uh, I think Yvonne also mentioned that um, there's something called count week. So on the day when we're looking for that special bird that always comes to your feeder at 11 o'clock and it doesn't show up, all is not lost. It might not show up for count day, but it might have been there for a day or two before or a day or two after the, the count day. So it does get counted as being present on the island during this basically a snapshot of what's here wintering. So that's kind of important to know. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about um, last year's count. Um, as you can expect, the weather is always way lots of fun when we're out counting. Sometimes it's snowing so hard you can't see or raining or blowing more likely on Nantucket. And occasionally we get the lovely day, but those are few and far between. But uh, 2019 was not a bad day. We were out in the field and um, all over Nantucket, 121 different uh, species were um, tallied on the day during that 24 hour period. Additionally, 10 additional um, birds, types of birds were seen during count week. We ended up with about 53 people um, in the field and as well as doing feeder counts. So that's, that's a pretty good um, amount of people out there looking for birds. So lots of interesting things were found. Um, among them, um, one, 150,000 common eider were counted. That's a lot of ducks. That's the birds that you see in great big huge numbers um, offshore or when you're going back and forth on the ferry that are mostly black and white birds. Um, the females are brownish, but um, that's, that's, a lot, that's a lot of birds out there. And this year, or last year, we only saw 5,600 long-tailed ducks now Libby just told you about a year back in 2003 where there were over, over half a million ducks making this flight from Nantucket um, Sound where they sleep at, at night out into the open ocean to feed out over the shoals. And they usually uh, would be bypassing um, the Madiket end or the west end of the island. So what happened? Where did all these birds go? Have, have, you know, they all died off? And we, the scientific community, we don't believe that there's been a precipitous loss of these birds in numbers, but it's just that it's really all about the food. And on the day, that's often the case. Where is the food and where are we going to find these birds? Um, I want to talk a little bit too about uh, Cal um, Carolina wrens. You guys probably, if you have feeders or even are hanging out in your yard, you've probably seen these wonderful little birds. And years ago, when I first started doing this count, there were none on Nantucket. Carolina wrens are among some birds that don't like to fly over water. And they made the jump from the Cape to Martha's Vineyard and eventually they got here to Nantucket. And last year, so they went from zero a few years ago to 281 Carolina wrens were tallied. 
last year in, in 2019. So it's gonna be interesting to see um, sort of how many are out there this year. As Libby mentioned, Nantucket is in a great spot because we have a very mild climate relative even to Cape Cod sometimes. We're out near the um, um, Gulf Stream, so we're a bit warmer. So things like Carolina wrens that are sort of on the northern edge of their um, uh, range are, have a, a pretty good ability to survive out here. But if when we have winters where there's a heavy snow or just you know weeks on end of really cold, raw, windy days, these little guys just can't make it. So sometimes you know you'll you'll notice four or five in your yard, and then long about March, where did they go? Well, maybe they just couldn't find enough food for the winter. So these are birds that are right on the edge of their survivability. Um, funny story about lesser black bat gulls. Um, they look a little bit like that yellow-legged gull that is uh, on the screen right now. Um, and they're a bird that um, is from, as we say, across the pond. They're not from North America. And years ago, and I can't remember what year it was, unfortunately, but years ago, uh, there were none. And then one Christmas bird count, one was found. And it was really, really, really exciting, except that it was dead. But it was really freshly dead. Its eyes were clear, its body was still warm. And I can recall there was a rather heated discussion as to whether or not we could actually count that bird as being on the Christmas bird count because it probably had been alive sometime during that 24 hour period. But more clear heads prevailed and it wasn't counted on the day. But uh, you, you get kind of passionate about this whole counting thing. Um, I think one of the other things I wanted to talk about is, is sort of what we're gonna expect for this year, get you all excited about maybe wanting to join. Um, 2020, in addition to being a lot of other bad stuff, is an interesting year for birders. It's called an eruptive year. And it's a year when um, seed crops up north have basically failed or have done very poorly. So there's not a lot of food for uh, what are called winter finches. And these are birds like um, red and white wing crossbills, pine siskins, red poles, and uh, evening grosbeaks and purple finches. Um, you guys may have noticed if you have bird feeders or just being out in your yard that there are an awful lot of red-breasted nuthatches around right now. That's also one of these eruptive birds. So it's a natural cycle of, um, excuse me, <coughs> must have be a bird feather, um, a natural cycle of, of the crops either being abundant or not abundant. In the years that they're not abundant, the birds actually move south. And this is one of those years. So get out your bird books, study up on some of these winter finches, and uh, hopefully you'll get to see one come into your feeder. Um, for snowy owl fans, it doesn't seem to be a eruptive year for snowy owls. So you'll have to look carefully and maybe you might spend most of the winter before you'll get to see one here on Nantucket. I guess I wanted to talk a little bit too about some uh, crazy stories that we've had while we've been out doing this crazy thing called the Christmas bird count. Um, one actually, uh, there was a lot of drama last year um, around a bird called a Western Kingbird. This was a bird that was found actually down the street from my house near my Comet Pond. It was very exciting. We had, I think, never had a Western Kingbird on the Christmas bird count. And um, we were checking on it every day to make sure it was doing okay down there, finding food and whatnot. And while a bunch of us were in the field watching this bird, just before the 24-hour period started, a Merlin came through, grabbed it up, and carried it off and ate it right in front of us. And we were absolutely gutted. Well, so was the bird, unfortunately. But um, it's just like one of those things that happens. 
Um, another weird thing that happened in 1989, um, a bunch of birders were coming over on the, on the steamship, coming over to do the Christmas bird count, and they saw this little dot flying, getting closer and closer and closer to the steamship, and it landed right on the boat, and it was a rose-breasted grosbeak, which is a bird that you just don't see here in the winter. Well, right as the boat started to come by Brant Point, Apparently this bird flew off and the joke kind of was, you know, it headed to town and the joke was, ho ho, I wonder if anybody will be able to find it for the Christmas bird count. And darned if somebody didn't. So it was actually counted on our Christmas bird count, which is kind of cool. Um, another time, uh, my friend Frank Gallo and I were out uh, with a specific duty of counting these thousands and thousands and thousands of long-tailed ducks at the end of the day out in Madigat and we're, we got our binoculars and we're looking out in the ocean and we've got our scopes and we're not seeing them and we're thinking oh my god what's going on and then we start hearing them because as they fly they make this sort of yodeling sound and we look up and literally right above us are thousands of these things coming over so we ended up standing back to back and staring straight up and counting as they came across it was a really bizarre thing. Um, just one more story because this one was almost tragic. Uh, another time, again, Frank and I were out in the west end of the island looking for a short-eared owl. And there had been one sighted there. We knew there was one there and we basically could not come home until we found this short-eared owl. So we're driving around out there slowly the headlights are on and we're looking and it's getting darker and darker and we're thinking, oh my God, how can we explain coming back without seeing this owl? We've got to get one for Edith for the count, Edith Andrews. And uh, all of a sudden, boom, one flies right in front of the car and we almost hit it. And that was like horrifying because I don't know how we ever could explain to Edith Andrews, who was the, the uh, compiler at the time as to how we had killed the only short-eared owl on the count. So that's just a couple of things that, that uh, have happened out there. There's, everybody has great stories. And uh, I hope we've gotten you guys excited enough that you wanna join in and help us out. So I'll throw it back to Yvonne. Well, thank you, um, Edie. More stories are welcome. Um, we're going to uh, close these slides so, so you can see us um, on a slightly bigger screen and um, answer a few questions and continue to discuss a little bit. Um, but if you're um, interested and you're on Nantucket and you'd like to be part of this, uh, email Edie at ackbird at aol.com and um, do this by the end of Christmas Day. So by the end of the day on the 25th. And um, she will confer with you about how to um, best incorporate you. Um, and uh, you'll get the information you need to do that. Um, if you're not on Nantucket and you are interested in joining a bird count, you should go to the, the map um, page on the Audubon, the National Audubon website, and uh, zoom in to the area where you live and find a count circle that um, you are inside of or that's near you and see what is available in your area to become involved in. It's also worth saying that um, there's nothing else like the Christmas bird count, but they do have another event in the spring. So if you're um, not able to be uh, involved this year uh, or right now, you can, um, you should keep looking at the Audubon website and tune into these events because they have um, another thing in the spring that they do as well that we could talk about at a later date. But I'm now going to close the slides and um, you should be able to uh, uh, post some questions and or comments. Um, I know um, we've got uh, Ken Blackshaw piping in, who is the other compiler um, and is listed in our um, circle, if you're on the Audubon website. Um, and he just wanted to say that he was out photographing and, and uh, 
was just in time to catch this. So it's nice that people are commenting um, as well as some other people, Scott Wilson, and um, would like to be here, uh, but can't. And so I think that's a common sentiment. We have had a lot of people involved. I mean, I feel very fortunate to um, be at the field station, a place that has a history um, with Edith Andrews and birding. And when I arrived, um, some of the first people I met was Edie um, and Ken and, and, I mean, Edie Ray, um, who came and said, oh, we have to talk about the Christmas bird count. And, so, <laughs> and I'm so grateful to have been um, able to be part of this because I'm not a birder, but now I am. And uh, it's really, um, a compulsion once you get going. And it's very interesting. And whether you are a naturalist, a biologist or not, it's a really um, fun thing to do with other people. There's a large network of very interesting people. And it is a true contribution. So anyone who does this, um, you're really contributing to the data sets that will be there for anyone to use for a very long time. And they're used for management of conservation space. They're used in policy decisions, as well as just understanding our natural environment and um, the dynamics that are going on in the ecology. Um, I am a fledgling birder, um, but I, so I have a lot of questions. Um, and uh, as well as other people, but I, I think that, um, yeah, I'll, I'll hold on. <laughs> Um, okay, so I just wanted to reassure people about the whole um, COVID stuff. Um, we are being exceptionally careful this year um, with, with keeping COVID in mind. Um, we're not doing any, just, you know, to put people's minds at rest, we're not doing any carpooling. You know, if you and your significant other, you know, or anybody in your household are are gonna be in one car together, that's fine. But I would never jump in the car with the likes of Yvonne, that's for sure. But um, <laughs> so we, we are being very careful. Masks are an absolute must, even out in the field. Um, Yvonne has put together a, uh, a very good way to report, let's say your um, feeder observations with no contact, data can be entered online. Um, Libby has put together instructions for the feeder watchers, so you never have to come and see us or touch us or anything. It's, it's, it's really great. So it's a great activity for people that want to stay safe and want to stay home. Um, and uh, the feeder watchers contribute so much to our data that we're hopeful that um, you'll want to join up. Yeah, and to just go with what Edie was saying about the feeder watchers, um, I know specifically for my section, I have about six people covering this whole giant area. So the feeder watchers like take little sections out of my area so I can't, I can focus my attention on more special areas that I really need to be in. Um, and honestly, I know some people are like, I'm not a birder. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. You, everybody's a birder. If you know what a chickadee is or a cardinal or anything, if anything with this bird count, every bird is like counted. So uh, don't get discouraged and don't think you can't do it. Cause you can, I promise. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it sounds really simple. Um, but I do have some questions. It, it is simple. You go out and you, you watch birds. Or you watch them through your window. That's the core of it. Um, but as a beginner, it, it can be challenging because you have to identify and you have to count. And um, Barbara White has posed a question. Um, thank you, Barbara. Can you explain the timing for the backyard feeders? Um, off and on, all day? How, how do you, so let's say, I want to be involved. I want to be a feeder watcher. Um, how do how do I do that? Do you have some tips? And so maybe the first question is, how do I structure my day about that? Do I watch the feeder all day long? 
Libby, do you want to jump in with that or do you want me to? Sure. Um, so if you want to be a feeder watcher, um, I can send you out. I made up this like cool checklist and it gives you more detailed instructions on how to do it. But basically we want our feeder watchers to just dedicate. Yeah, Edie's got it right there. <laughs> just dedicate as much time as you want within this 24 hour period and just keep track of the amount of time that you're there. So say you want to be there from 10 to 1030, then you would write down, I was there for 30 minutes and I saw X amount of birds and then you took a break and you came back again from 12 to 12 30 so that's another 30 minutes and then the whole idea I know with people counting the birds um, it's the maximum number of birds that you see at that one time so if the first time I saw two chickadees the second time I saw three chickadees and then the third time I saw one chickadee I would say I saw a total of three chickadees for that day <laughs> because that was the maximum number of that one species that I got all at once. So even, uh, even if you are watching for 10 hours and you mm -hmm. see one or two at a time, and then you see three, you've only seen three. I mean, you yeah, because heard three as your yeah. amount that you've seen. And because that's they're con constantly going back and forth and back and forth. And it, it's just a matter of, what you see in that one snapshot of like the the highest amount <laughs> that makes sense i've noticed that's, that's uh, sort of, that's sort of the same thing that people ask us when we're out in the field counting you know like we see a flock of 20 crows well how do you know that you didn't see 10 twice you know so it sort of all comes out in the wash because you're obviously with you know, even 50 people out in the field on Nantucket, we're going to not see some birds. And we might see a couple of those birds two or three times, but it sort of all comes out in the average. So um, that's another real common question, Yvonne, is how do you know you haven't counted that one twice? Yeah. So if you're, if you're at a feeder, what I've noticed here, so I've been playing around with my feeder station and um, I, I had... It seems to me that I have more chickadees than I'm counting, but you can't say that. You can't count that. You have to be sure. So I thought, well, maybe I should set another feeder up within an area that I can see where they won't chase each other away. But if I have more than a couple, now I might be able to see that, right? Um, that's, I wouldn't say a tip I have, but that's a strategy I'm using to see if um, there's actually more than maybe I can provide more space for them to feed at different feeders at different heights some food on the ground um things like that i read from a book that i got from edie <laughs> about ways to um try to create more variation so that more birds may come and also a little spread it out a little bit um but uh how do you know that what i'm counting at my feeder or within my area of a quadrant isn't being counted by someone else as well. So that's a different question, but it's similar to what, I mean, you were just saying, how do you know you're not double counting? So is there, actually, I think, how do you do, how do you I do? think on the answer is we really don't. Um, an example of, of sort of what you're talking about is uh, years ago, my mom lived right next door to me and we both had feeders and we always kept saying, oh my gosh, we have so many cardinals coming to our feeders. So one time we decided to sort of try to figure it out. We figured we must have, you know, at least a dozen. So we both went to our windows at the same time and we basically said, ready, set, go. And we started counting just what was in our yard at our feeders. Now they right next to each other. We ended up with over 20 cardinals. So yes, you are probably missing some, but in the grand scheme of things, it all comes out in the wash. So you might only see a high number of three chickadees. You might in fact have 12 really, because they're coming and going all the time, but you can't guess. You have to just, you know, this is collecting data. So you have to just go with what you can see. So here's a few comments coming in. So Ken is commenting, you may um, double count, but you are also missing a lot of birds because you can't be everywhere at once. So don't agonize about it. That's a great point. It's this 
that's what you're saying as well. Um, <laughs> and Barbara followed up with, and if we see a bird we can't identify, we can send a photo, is that correct? That's a great point is that um, depending on the year, there are some unusual birds here on Nantucket. And this could be one of them. So have your bird book handy, have your camera handy. And we like to say there is, there is no picture that's, that's, you know, any picture is a good picture. No picture is a bad picture. Even if it's kind of sort of fuzzy, if you're just using your cell phone, whatever you can take with whatever device you have, try to get a picture if it's something weird out there at your feeder. Um, we'll try to help you identify it. And within the uh, instructions that Libby will be sending you, if you want to be a feeder watcher, um, uh, there's information as to what to do with that, it, that picture or that information. Um, but try to get a picture. Any picture is better than no picture. And, uh, you know, be on the lookout. I know that um, I'm always trying to make common things into something wildly unusual. So it's good to have photographic evidence of uh, what you're actually seeing out there. Yeah, I'm always guilty of the morning doves because of the way they fly. I always want to make it something really cool, but then it's like, ah, it's morning dove. <laughs> <laughs> Where it's, every bird is cool. It could be a white winged dove. You never know. So yep. you just never know. <laughs> I talked a little bit earlier about sort of a, a friendly competition between, you know, the different groups on the island. Uh, the different eight sections as to who can come up with the most species of birds or the most unusual bird. And I do want to mention that we do have a little inner island uh, competition with uh, the vineyard group that, you know, that other island over there to the west of us. I, you may have heard of it, I don't know. But um, I had a little chat with Luann at Biodiversity Works the other day and uh, so we're waiting to see who can come up and, and sort of win the Island Cup of uh, CBC bird counts this year. Who's gonna have the most birds? Unfortunately, sometimes it comes down to the weather on the day. Um, last year, I know uh, Luann had, the Martha's Vineyard had an absolutely atrocious day. I think it like rained all day and was just ugly. And we had like pretty much a walk in the park. So that wasn't really a fair competition, but We'll see this year who uh, comes out on top. Now, um, what about Muskegon and Tucker Nut? Are they their own circle or are they part of Nantucket? Yeah, they, they are their own circle. Um, so that count is totally separate from Nantucket. Interesting. Um, we had another comment come in. Let's see. Um, this is... Uh, Scott Wilson, again, is saying he did the Hartford um, CBC yesterday, so the Christmas bird count. So like we were saying earlier, some places do them. Um, every place has the option of when to do them, and some have already occurred. Uh, there was bad weather, but we had a lot more hairy woodpeckers than usual. Are you seeing a lot of them on Nantucket this year on ACT? Do you guys have an idea? Well, uh, interestingly uh, enough, yeah. I just had one in my yard the other day. That's one of the birds. I'm always trying to make downy woodpeckers into hairy woodpeckers, but usually it doesn't work. But the other day it actually did. I looked out and I was like, whoa, that guy's kind of big. Got my binos on it. And sure enough, it was a hairy woodpecker. Um, I think one had been seen, maybe even one of uh, the Sunday morning bird walks had a hairy woodpecker down the road. Um, from my house uh, not too long ago. So there are a few here, but they're much, much, much less common than downy woodpeckers on Nantucket. And that's kind of an interesting thing too, because things are always changing in the natural world. And years ago, we didn't have red-bellied woodpeckers here. There just weren't any at all. And now they're, I would say, pretty much a common uh, backyard feeder bird on most of the island. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting doing this over the years to see those numbers going up and up and up of different species. Um, probably none of you watching would know, but years and years ago, there were no cardinals here. And I can remember um, hearing the story from Edith Andrews of my father-in-law, Louis, calling her all excited because he had a cardinal coming to his feeder. And it was, 
if not the first, but one of the very few ones on the island. So we see birds coming, you know, their numbers getting bigger, their numbers getting smaller, and all of this is important data that's being collected. So keep your eyes out there. Or as Vern Locks would say, keep your eyes to the sky. I haven't seen more questions come in. Um, oh. So Ken is saying he did his section of the Venice area of Florida. So for those of you who aren't in the Nantucket birding circle, Ken Blackshaw is um, a rather notable uh, bird book author and um, three minute radio sh bird sound uh, host as well, and um, is in Florida right now. And so he's saying that um, the count yesterday had perfect weather and they had 83 species in their section. A uh, strange year since everyone had to be distant. So yeah, it's going to be a really different year um, with the COVID reality. Um, but Audubon has uh, clear guidelines about how to carry this out. And so does every group that's working um, on the Christmas bird count. Um, and as has been stated already, if you're staying home, that's the safest thing you can do and you can watch your feeder or your backyard. Um, and so this is really a great thing to involve your kids with if you're stuck at home and you're getting stir crazy. <laughs> um, it pulls you outside, even if you're still in the house or you're in your backyard, it really pulls you out of yourself a little bit to be looking around um, and trying to identify what you're seeing. It's uh, really fun and rewarding. Um, and if you're not sure, there's a, a great community of people that are very um, helpful and quick to answer questions and help you to um, think your way through it so that you're not just always asking someone, you, you develop a way to identify. I myself are um, lucky out here uh, at the station that we have marsh, pond, and harbor areas where I can see large wading birds or floating birds or swimming, diving birds. And that's helped uh, me develop the ability to identify some things. I find the songbirds tricky. So um, feeders are great because you draw them to the feeder, um, but which makes it a little easier than walking around and looking in bushes where they're hiding. <laughs> very well eating seeds but if you don't have feeders but you have you know bushes with um, berries on them bayberry is everywhere here you will have birds in there eating so that anywhere that has um, vegetation still you may be able to spot birds um, and let's see uh, Ken is, is piping in again hoping to see more feeder watchers in the report this year so yeah, you can definitely contribute a lot with the feeders and from home. Um, how about- and, and on this year, we've had a really great response to feeder watchers. I think, um, as you said, you know, people are stuck at home and they're being good and they're not going out and, but they've got their feeders going or they're just looking out their windows. So I think this year is gonna be probably our biggest amount of feeder watchers. And I know that um, National Audubon has stressed the importance of feeder watchers this year because uh, they anticipate less people being able to go out in the field and bird. So you feeder watcher guys, you got to take up the slack. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and email you, us and uh, get on board. You can see other things too. So I was trying hard to uh, notice the trends of the feeders out here. And I was watching them yesterday a lot and all of a sudden a large flock of European starlings showed up. And if I hadn't been watching, um, you know, maybe they, I wouldn't have seen them, although I probably would have noticed there were about 70 of them. <laughs> so they They're pretty loud too. <laughs> um, but they really didn't stick around that long. They stopped in a few spots. They kind of went back and forth a bit and then they were gone after maybe 30 or 40 minutes. So they really didn't hang out that long. So it's, um, you may see things that you don't expect if you're really watching and tuning in for the day. Um, yep. And 
I think, oh, go ahead. So I just want to warn you guys that are taking up feeder watching. It's a little addicting. It's kind of, <laughs> I, I'm serious. It's kind of like fishing. If you've ever been fishing, you know, you can stand there for hours throwing that line, throwing that line. And you know, as soon as you stop, the biggest fish is going to swim by looking for something to eat. It's the same with feeder watching. You're staring at that feeder. You're not doing things you're supposed to be doing around the house or, you know, running an errand you might have to do because, you know, as soon as you stop looking at that feeder, a flamingo is going to come by and land in your yard and, you know, drink out of your bird bath or something. So just be warned, have some food nearby, have something to drink because you're going to get, get stuck watching out that window at those feeders probably for hours. People may never hear from you again. You just know. <laughs> it's, it's frightening. It's frightening. Uh, Barbara White has, has written in another comment or question. If we see hawks in the distance, but not at our feeder, do we count those two? Um, so yeah, that's a good point. Uh, where is the boundary and, and what do you count and what don't you count? Um, so not just what's at your feeder, but um, yeah, do you, do you have a suggestion for? Well, I think, I think Libby could answer this because, you know, it, the bird doesn't have to be actually sitting on your feeder to count, but Libby, why don't you take that? Um, I think you can definitely count, like, say a hawk came by and took your bird off your feeder. Um, it, it's a little stretch when the hawk is in somebody else's yard like that for, it, it's mostly like the birds within your yard surrounding your feeder. Because for the most part, even if you have like a feeder in your backyard or in your front yard, ideally all these birds are in the same general area and they're all gonna be part of your feeder count. If that makes any sense? I don't know, Edie, if you wanna. No, I think I think that's good. You know, it's it's really, you know, if you have a really great vista from your house and, you know, you see something really crazy out there, you might want to let somebody know. But I think Libby's description of sort of the general area of your yard and your feeder um, is, is definitely sort of a good boundary to keep in mind. And mm -hmm. definitely you might have a hawk sitting on your neighbor's fence waiting for some good looking chickadee to come by that, uh, looks like lunch. So that bird you'd want to count for sure. So mm -hmm. you'd, you'd want to note it, mm -hmm. um, even if it's not. Is that what I'm hearing? So Yeah, I would still wanna... note down everything that you see. Yeah. Um, and then we are going to be collecting like all these data sheets and we're going to review them and everything. So for the most part, write down everything you see because somebody else might have not have seen it. So it will be really important. And the time especially mm -hmm. something like that. I mean, yeah, the time. And then, okay, if it's a hawk, you want to, if it's flying, you want to know which direction it's flying to because it might fly into somebody else's who's doing another feeder watch and fly over their property. So we'll see it once we get like the data sheets back in, if it was the same hawk or not. For instance, um, every year we always have to figure out how many red tails are actually here on Nantucket because any of you that's been out and about and have seen red tails, they tend to fly around looking for something to eat. And so they don't understand the dividing lines between the territories. So one red tailed hawk might fly through three different territories on its way looking for lunch. So we always note, those of us that are doing this out in the field, we always note with hawks like that, um, where they're you know, what time we saw them, and as Libby said, what was the direction of travel? You know, so we don't end up with 600 red-tailed hawks being reported on Nantucket, which would not, of course, be accurate. Just one hawk that flew around a lot. And that would seem to apply to the, the, uh, the harbor as well. So if, we're, if there's a couple of us all looking at the harbor, we might see some of the same birds and be counting. Right. But then again, Yvonne, it's like, you know, you and I might see the same one, you know, black scoter, but we probably didn't see 20 or 30 others. So it's, 
it's going to all sort of come out in the wash eventually. But we do draw imaginary lines down the middle of the harbor so that the group that's on one side isn't counting exactly the same birds that are on the other side. We, we try to uh, divvy it up. Mm -hmm. In the, um, oh, we have another comment. So uh, Barbara responded with, uh, we can see from our yard almost all the way to nobody or bluff and do see red tails and harriets. So she's saying, do, do I not count them? That's what it seems <laughs> okay, like so Barbara, so Barbara, here's the thing. <laughs> so you're looking at part of my territory or my section's territory. Mm -hmm. So you just go right ahead and count them. Just write down. <laughs> Because you'll save me the trouble, right? No, write down when you saw them and direction of travel. And that will be, that'll help me because uh, that, that Surfside section uh, is a big section. So that, that'll be very helpful. So you count them for me. Thank you. And then when it comes to birds that you can tell the difference between male and female, like the Northern Harrier, the females will be brown, the males will be silver. That's a really good note too of what you're seeing. If, right. you, if, you, if you know that. I mean, it, it's okay if you don't, but it does help when we're trying to figure out the birds. <laughs> well, I hope we've excited a lot of people out there <laughs> to either wander around in the woods with us or to look out their windows and, and uh, count feeder birds. And um, this is a, a, good, a good thing to be doing during this crazy COVID time. And mm -hmm. uh, I just want to thank everybody for tuning in and taking a few minutes to listen to us. <laughs> yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, and thank you, Libby and Edie. This was great. I could keep spinning questions at you if you don't mind. I have Sure, whatever you want to do. So uh, um, a, a comment or a question, too, and again, to people who maybe haven't done this before and are thinking of, of doing a feeder watch, um, you don't even really need any equipment, although binoculars are, are good um, or a spotting scope is great, but you could just watch. You don't need anything fancy. And if you have a cell phone and you can take a picture, you can then um, zoom in on the photo or you can take a little video. Video is great. I found that um, as I try to identify things, the bird behavior. Mm -hmm. So you think you need this perfect picture so you can compare it to a picture but watching it move around um, and then going back and, and trying to identify something you, you you read the descriptions of how the bird moves or was it feeding on the ground or um, slightly elevated and oh yeah I was going to ask you guys do you have any tips on um, what to put out for birds to eat actually I just wrote myself a note to mention this um, <laughs> The, the more variety of food, just like a buffet, the more variety you can offer, the more, the more birds are going to come to your, your feeding station. So one of the things that people often overlook is water. Mm -hmm. When you think in the wintertime and all the puddles are frozen and the ponds are iced over, water is almost more important than, than food. Because you can go without food for a while, but water is so important. So um, a heated birth, bleh, a heated bird bath, say that twelve times fast, is um, is really really a good thing. If you don't have a heated bird bath, and it doesn't cost much in electricity, and we know the bills are high here on Nantucket, so <laughs> yeah, pennies. But the uh, heated bird bath keeps that water just above freezing so that the birds can uh, get in there and drink and have a bath. Um, if you don't have a heated bird bath, just going out and breaking the ice on your bird bath or adding water to it so that there's fresh water there for the birds is super important. But you can have different kinds of seeds. You can have mixed seeds. You can do um, finch seed to maybe get some of those uh, eruptive uh, winter finches coming in, the Niger seed, the little tiny black ones. Um, you can do uh, suet. Suet is great because birds really need protein in the winter. They don't have insects and things to eat, like those little Carolina wrens that are creeping around underneath your picnic table and whatnot, looking for spiders and bugs um, that are wintering over. Um, 
Suet is easily obtainable at um, most of the places on the Nantucket that sell bird seed and even at the grocery store at this point. Mm -hmm. um, you can put that out and that's a, a great thing for birds and sunflower seed. Yeah, so if you have gonna... a variety of different foods, that's a, a really great way to get them to come into your yard. And the other thing is, not now, but in the spring when you're looking at your yard, think about maybe planting some um, native plants that produce berries, things like bayberry, things like um, inkberry, um, hot, different kinds of um, hollies, things that um, will be a benefit as far as not only food in producing berries, but also that will um, produce cover for the birds. Because if you plop a bird feeder right out in the middle of a big open lawn, you're not gonna get too many birds. And the birds you get are eventually gonna turn out to be hawk food because birds need cover. So by placing your bird feeders in the periphery of your yard where there's ample cover for the birds to emerge from a shrubbery and grab a bird seed and go back in and eat it, that's a really good way to do it. Um, so kind of think about that maybe in the spring when you're planting. And the other trick, it's a really good trick. Um, I'm a really lazy gardener and I plant a lot of flowering plants and things, Coreopsis and stuff, Rutabecchia and stuff in my yard. And um, in the fall, I don't actually clean up my yard really well. And I just tell everybody I'm leaving it all, all those seeds that those flowers have produced for the birds. Well, that is true, but it also is true that I'm just too lazy to do anything about it. But um, by planting, things and allowing them to go to seed, that's a great way to attract birds. I have goldfinches that are literally about six inches out my picture window because they're coming into um, some of the plants that I have yet to clean up from uh, the summer. So just a little trick. Yeah. That's great. I've heard that um, you can have oranges and put them out and some birds like to come for the fruit. Um, is that something people do? Well, what, one of the things you do want to be careful of is not sort of a bait and switch thing. Mm -hmm. You don't want to put stuff out for just the week that the Christmas bird count is and then stop feeding and stop offering water because birds become habituated to coming to your yard and they depend on that food and that water. So you don't want to just, you know, put a bunch of stuff out there and then once you've finished counting them or whatever, stop feeding. That's, that's really not appropriate. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, once you get started, you, these birds are, are depending on you uh, to get them through the winter. Um, so um, just keep putting out seed. Yeah, and keep putting out seed, especially before the Christmas bird count, because if you just start on that day, they're, you're not gonna get that many. <laughs> <laughs> they want to be guaranteed food. So <laughs> that's my tip. And then any, like what Edie was saying, any bird seed with sunflower seeds, so many birds love those and um, just go nuts over them. So. Cool. Um, well, I don't see any more comments um, or questions. So if you're out there and you have one, type it now. Because um, <laughs> we... We're after seven o'clock and we should probably wrap this up. Um, thank you to, again, uh, this has been really fun and um, I'm sure we could talk at length and I would love to hear more stories. I'm sure there are many more. Um, oh, but there's some I can't tell. <laughs> My lips are, <laughs> sorry. We'll just have to wait. Um, <laughs> well, thanks again. And um, anyone, um, who is watching this, you, you can see it again. It will be on YouTube. Um, so this is being recorded and I usually take it down and um, have to put it up on its own web URL so it will change location, but you will find it on the UMass Nantucket um, Field Station YouTube channel. And uh, I will make that known. So uh, feel free to watch it as many times as you like and um, contact 
us if you have questions or comments. And um, O'Ken said, maybe we can do this after the count to kind of discuss what actually happened. Um, and that's a good idea. So we were just actually talking about that before we went on live. <laughs> be able to report back to you guys that have watched this. Yeah, yeah, it's a great- Thank you for taking the time to watch it, by the way. Yeah, thanks. Yes, thank you everybody um, for watching it and for your participation and for writing questions and comments. And um, we will be um, out there burning. So send us your, your input and your um, questions if you'd like to join and we'll see you doing that. Thank you again.